What's up, bro? That's your boy, Mike Muse. Welcome to the conversation, the Mike Muse Show. I am so excited to be back in conversation uh, with the incredible Greg Harden, affectionately known as G Harden. So if I slip up and say G Harden, you guys would know what I'm talking about. He was already on the Mike Muse Show again, and it got such a great response. Um, you guys have been DMing me and hitting me up uh, about this conversation. And so I knew I was going to do this conversation with him again at some point. Um, but I didn't know it would be so soon because we are coming off of, you already know what I'm about to say, the University of Michigan football team is a national championships, baby, go blue. We are coming off an amazing road to championships. I called it. I told you all on September the 1st that Michigan was going all the way. Y'all didn't believe me. Everyone <laughs> caught up, hit me up and said, I'm lying. No way. I'm smoking all the things. And I stood on my ground. I said, no, we're going all the way. And I was like, this is a special team. And Greg Harden, as you know from the last time, we talked about it briefly, but we didn't go too much in depth. We really wanted to focus on his book, uh, Stay Sane in the Insane World, which is a New York Times bestseller, by the way. Uh, we really focus on more so about the book. Uh, and not so much about his role with the team. Yes, he's uh, coached Tom Brady. Yes, um, he's coached as Howard. Uh, yes, he's coached Michael Phelps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but he is still at Michigan. Um, and he is an empowerment coach um, for the sports teams that are there in particular, um, this team. And I just think that sports is mental. And I just think that when you get to a national championship, no matter what sport that you're in, it is about your mental fortitude and your mental capacity. And I know... Uh, G. Harden was on the sidelines. I know that for a fact because of the Ohio State game. I'm like, yo, where are you at? Let's get together for a drink, some coffee or something. He said, Mike, I'm locked in with the team right now in the locker room. I'm like, got it. Say less. Let me not disturb greatness. And I saw him on the sideline this year's Rose Bowl. And so I couldn't wait to really get him back on the show uh, to really kind of unpack the mental dynamic of this football team. So without further ado, uh, my man, G. Harden, what's going on, Greg? Mike, it's a, I'm thrilled to have an opportunity to talk with you. You know, I'm one of your biggest fans in life. Even when you were a snot nose, 17, 18, 19-year-old, <laughs> you were brilliant. Uh, you Thank made you. me think about uh, Aido Ose and Greg Posey, who was yes. the smartest man I had ever met in life. And yes. so they were huge fans, and they made me believe in you. And, and I've always uh, looked forward to talking to you. Thank you so much, man. And just as a personal note, uh, not only have you helped my audience, but personally, you have helped me. Um, one, while I was in school and all the way through where I'm at right now, but in particular on the last conversation that we had here on the Mike Muse Show, uh, when I was talking about the challenges I'm having with, you know, coming up to home plate and hitting a grand slam um, and the pressure that I feel and anxiety that it gives me. And you told me that I have to start to reframe my thinking to enjoy the pressure and to love the pressure and to have a different approach, which ultimately got to self-love. And so I've been putting that in practice. It's, it's a working progress. It's a muscle you got to keep working on. But anytime I have big moments, I always say to myself, Mike, love the pressure, love the moment. And it's been a help. And I've been your biggest evangelist uh, telling everybody else to love the pressure. So thank you, sir. Yes, sir. And, and what you opened the door to talk about is how do we get people to stop being afraid of being afraid? And so we begin to turn fear and anxiety into a normal human experience. It's what we do. It's what you have to face. It's what you have to go through. I reminded you some of the most exciting moments in your life, my life, the life of whoever is listening, some of the greatest adventures they've been on. They're about to crap their pants before <laughs> they, they embarked on that journey. And so half the fun in life is not being overwhelmed by the fact that I'm anxious. In fact, if you're not anxious, you're not human. If you're not nervous, something's wrong with you. But to embrace it, to turn anxiety into excitement, to turn fear into fire and passion, that's what we teach. That's what we try to push. That's what the book talks about. That's what I talk about to any athlete, any CEO, any attorney, anybody I'm working with, they have to be clear that is normal to be anxious and nervous and afraid and to I love that I love that the uh, the last episode audience you got to go back and watch it uh, so we don't want to do a deep dive into it but I love the Tom Brady analogy and audience are brought it up very naturally about it made me think about Tom Brady in that Super Bowl in Atlanta when two minutes remaining I can't remember the exact number of touchdowns but he scored like 
10 touchdowns in like two minutes for the <laughs> for the Patriots to come back and win the game. And you were just saying that that was a muscle that you guys have been working on since undergrad, you know, when he was a, a quarterback at Michigan to really enjoy the pressure. And I couldn't think of a more pressure filled moment than two minutes. You're down by a couple of touchdowns in Atlanta, Super Bowl's on the line. That is pressure at its finest with the whole world watching you uh, and how to embrace it. And then we still see the ultimate victory. But I want to talk about before we go on to Michigan's football team and how you constructed them to get mentally ready uh, to raise that trophy about self-love and acceptance. I thought that was a big piece that I've been focusing on too as well in as a companion to um, enjoying the pressure. Well, we talk about the four A's uh, and the four A's that are in everyone's life is the need for attention, affection, approval, and acceptance. But too often we're looking outside of ourselves for all those four A's from everybody else. And when you go to the next level of self-awareness, you begin to understand that the secret that's not a secret is self-love, being affectionate and attentive to yourself, and self-acceptance. Accepting yourself, flaws and all. (laughs) That's the hard part. Because we don't want to have flaws and we don't want to acknowledge them. And I'm saying, look, I, as if you if you were perfect, I would pray to you tonight. However, I don't think I'll be praying to you tonight. So be human. Being a human being is a wonderful adventure, especially since we have trials and tribulations and self-imposed limitations. And all we're trying to do is stop being the problem. If the enemy within can't harm you, who can? That's it. Who can? All right, Greg, let's just get into it because, audience, this is such a special treat. It's rare that we get a chance to go inside the locker room and really talk about the mental preparedness and fortitude of champions. Literally, because we are champions, we're the trophy, we're champions. And this is a special treat. You won't find this anywhere else in the world, uh, but right here. Uh, Greg, I was with uh, the University of Michigan football team as my sophomore year when we won the last national championship at the Rose Bowl. I've been on the journey ever since. I've, I made a pact to myself to go back to every game at least once per season. I've been doing that since I graduated. I was on the journey when we went to the first time in the playoffs in Miami where we played Georgia, the second game when we played TCU. Then I came back to this year's Rose Bowl and then journeyed with the with the Houston. I felt team had something special and I think Greg if I can I want to focus on the last playoff game between TCU to the point where we lost to the point where we won in Houston um, defeating um, Washington Uh, there was something about that TCU game last year in Phoenix that that I, I would never forget I remember walking into the stadium the fans are chanting, we're chanting, they're chanting. But it was almost this understanding from TCU that they knew they weren't going to win the game. It was almost like they were happy to be there. And then we get into the stadium, and the first drive, I believe, I think it's an interception, TCU goes on to score, and the energy just drained from the stadium. And I just want to know, like, from that moment when we lost, how did that team to respond and to think mentally up into Houston? Well, that's a really good question, and, and it does go to that spot, but it goes even beyond. I think one of the best things that happened to Michigan was the Georgia. The Georgia loss set it up so that our strength and conditioning coach, Ben Herbert, was obsessed with the fact that Georgia was tossing our big boys around, and he basically went never again. He basically decided that they would never be tossed around by anybody. And you'll see now guys who are kind of undersized tossing big fellows around. I mean, look at uh, 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 Mason, uh, what is it, Graham? Grant, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mason Graham is an undersized kid who will abuse you. Uh, Mr. Grant, 78. It's an unbelievable, gigantic phenomenon who's stronger and faster than anybody. The Georgia game sent a message to our team that we needed to take it to another level. But then you look at the TCU game, and we're clearly confident and clear about what we're going to do. I want to hold that thought right there, Greg, because you're right about tossing our players around. 
I remember I had fantastic <laughs> seats at that game. And I remember when our players came out, but I remember when them Georgia boys came out and I was like, boys are gigantic. Right. Yeah. And I was like, never seen that before. <laughs> and so I think there is something what you're saying about the size and the strength and conditioning um, about when it comes to that. So I'm glad you, you, you brought that up because that came out for me just as a spectator. And so you'll see that the culture that we built is not just wanting to have the best athletes, but having the strongest with more endurance and more mental capacity to, to maintain performance over time. And that's been developed over the years. But now we got to go even further back. I want you to think about this for a moment. Uh, and before I go any further, let's acknowledge that Ward Manuel, the athletic director, and Jim Harbaugh invited me into the system. I was I was clearly retired, <laughs> minding my own business. And, <laughs> and they said, look, uh, please come in and work with our team. Jim Harbaugh allowed me to work with his staff and his, with his players. And the beauty of all that is we go even further back to when Blake Corum was a freshman. Come on. Blake Corum was a freshman, and there was turmoil in the building and confusion. And I think Jim had just uh, examined the possibilities of the NFL. And the locker room was like, ah. Uh, but he – and un, Jim had – was – being well paid and was not performing at the level that everyone anticipated. And he'd had six years of being the head coach and it fluctuated to a degree where you had to make some decisions. The athletic director decided to share with Jim Harbaugh his expectations and his needs. And Jim Harbaugh looked at the athletic director and said, it makes total sense to me. He says, what you need me to do and how I need to uh, uh, transform this team. He changed his staff. He, he, and, and Jim will tell you, he didn't change. All he did was get better and improve. He was committed to continuous improvement, and he looked at what worked and what didn't work. And he concluded that he made it, needed to make some shifts. Well, what was going on also is that they, we were obsessed with getting five stars and superstars. And Blake Corum and his gang were totally unimpressed with the seniors and the juniors and the attitudes that they had his freshman year. Blake Corum and a handful of other guys, Hill Green, Haskins, they allowed me in our freshman meetings to talk about they were here to change the culture. I'm talking about four years ago, man, three, four years yeah. ago, we yeah. talked about shifting the culture. Blake Corum, Aiden Hutchinson was in the first year that was looking at, hmm, something needs to change. So Jim Harbaugh empowered 18, 19, 20, 21-year-olds to help transform the culture. Our recruiting coordinators, our recruiting wizards, they all went out and they were told, you know, we can we can get stars. What we need is people who are coachable and committed to Michigan. So instead of recruiting just stars, we recruited families. Mm -hmm. We recruited kids who you could tell respected their mother, their father, their coach, whoever raised them. And not only were they hungry, they were humble, which means they were coachable. Blake Corn, Aiden Hutchinson. I mean, we had freshmen setting the tone in the locker room. Freshmen and sophomores who began to say, this, we're, we, this is a brotherhood. This is a brotherhood, and we care about each other. They weren't, I love the idea. I love the idea of families. I love the idea of like, we're not looking for stars, looking for families, because you always talk about 
people always talk about the team as a unit or as a family. And there's a humility that comes with a family. There, there's a deference of order, right? There's a deference of respecting the mother and the father. There's a deference with respecting your elders when your grandmother, your grandfather walks into the room. Uh, there's a deference in respecting the older brother or the older sister. But the older brother and the older sister, when it's a good family unit, respects the younger, right? And wants to empower in that lineage to be a continuum of, of, a, of a thing. And so I could, now that you're talking, I can see how that minds of a family who's coachable can shift to understanding the culture and how the culture needs to change. These and particularly kids. in this era of the transfer portal and where we yeah. are right now, staying together as a unit. And you mentioned Blake. You know, I listened to that statement that Blake said when he came back and everybody thought last year after the big TCU loss that Blake could have went to the NFL. But Blake said, I got something unfinished business unfinished business with this family. That's the culture you're talking and, about. And that's what J.J. McCarthy and Blake Corum are now the core of that team. They're, they're clear that they had unfinished business. You do realize that in August and September they were talking about national championship, which makes you nervous as all get out. Because <laughs> if you're thinking that far ahead... What are you thinking about the the game you have next week? Yeah. But are, how, Greg Harden, how did that – what was the mood? We lose the game. All the zeros are on the scoreboard. Marching back into the locker room. Getting back on the team bus to head to the team charter plane to head back to Ann Arbor. Because that was our year. That was what was supposed to be the year that we got to the championship. That yeah. was supposed to be the year, the rematch between Georgia and Michigan. It was supposed to take the lessons learned and lost from the previous year in Miami. We're going to take it. We're going to beat this TCU team easy, and we're going to go to the national championship game. So, like, that was supposed to be our year. So what was the mood like, you know, on that ride back home to Ann Arbor? Unlike uh, yesteryear when the mood going back would be so depressing, these kids and these coaches were clear that they needed to make another shift. They needed to upgrade some more. They need, and these these guys were confident that they would be back. I mean, that's all they talk about. They were talking about, we'll be back. We'll see, we'll be back next year. I mean, this is like in what, January? Wow. Yeah. They were so clear about what they should have done, could have done, and they and they didn't get stuck in beating themselves up or worrying about the outcome, all they needed to do was not just go through it, grow through it. And that's what they did. That's powerful because I never give up on the team, but I was so deflated for so long, right? And since that moment, but what you're saying is like that mental fortitude that was in them, but since you have been coaching them, their mental coach since freshman year, to exactly audience why I set the tone, set the table, family style of self-love, acceptance, and enjoying the pressure. Since freshman year, by the time they get to a junior year playing that game, that loss, still love on self, accept it, but then prepare for what's next. Because what you're doing is deciding what do I need to take it to the next level? And, and, and that's all they were thinking about. This will never happen again. That's how they were thinking. And I can't take all the credit for their, their mental toughness. I'm not suggesting that they did it because of what I taught them. But guess what? They were teachable. What you said, they're looking for family members, not stars, right? Coachable. Uh, we had, look, when you look at our recruiting classes, we weren't number one, number two, or number three recruiting class in the last three or four years. So that tells you something about recruiting certain types of individuals who you know can be developed and pushed and pulled, and they would join a family. And, and all these teams we hear about now, basketball, football, hockey, talking about family. This was truly a grounded obsession with this team, was to create a family that could endure anything, including a loss. What do you think it was about J.J. McCarthy's um, mental preparation? Because 
there was a time previously, no matter who was that quarterback at Michigan, I would be nervous every time the ball left their hand. Yes. But there was something about this year, shift in J.J. McCarthy, I felt from last year to this year, where every time the ball left his hands, I was never worried. And so I'm just wondering, what was that mental shift um, that you guys worked on or talked through without giving any personal details, but just in general, the narrative uh, shift? J.J. Uh, was obsessed with the mental game. Did you hear what I say? He was obsessed with the mental game. J.J. Would, is, was Okay, he is the closest thing to Desmond Howard and Tom Brady, who were in my office picking my brain, insisting that I give them any anything they could to could use for an advantage to get their mind right. And JJ be, was allowed me to teach him that at this stage, the game is mental. The game was mental before, but you were playing against 14, 15, 16 year olds. Duh. Yeah. So physically, you could decide, you know, if you're physically better than they are, you, you, you're the guy. But at this level, everybody was the guy in high school. The mental game becomes crucial. And, and J.J. loved the whole concept of the mental game giving him an advantage. So what we, just, what we talk about and what I'll talk about to anyone that will listen, if you can develop muscle, you can develop the mind. What we discuss and what we push is if you've got to work, if you have to work out all the time, nonstop in the weight room, and if you take a week off, you're two weeks behind. And people think that all they need to do is go in and get uh, go see somebody for counseling once, maybe twice, and then they're done. Thank you very much. I'm off. This kid was clear that he needed to train his mind. He trained his mind. I mean, can you just think about the, the Washington game in the fourth quarter. I mean, this was crucial, right? And he was so frustrated that he didn't get the, the first down. And he, he would and he'd come over to the sideline, and all he had to do was look at him and say, it's all mental. And he, he would just shift and relax. He would breathe. You could see him just deliberately and intentionally shaking it off, letting it go. Is that is that what you said? Because there is clips of you going around uh, of you talking to him on the sideline. Is, is that that all, moment you're talking about? All we're talking about is what he already knows. I'm not telling tell him what to do. All I can tell him to do is remember what you already know, what you've already trained yourself to believe. I want to give that in context, audience, because we're we're talking about this there. And I'm not like this is just to put this into context, you harden. The energy was thick fourth quarter. Remember at the Rose Bowl, I got na my I felt nauseous at the fourth quarter in the Rose Bowl against Alabama. I felt nauseous to the point where I made sure I didn't eat a heavy meal on this game because I didn't want to get nauseous again. I learned my lesson from the last one. But that fourth quarter, you just knew that Washington was feeling themselves, right? They felt there was some momentum happening. And I felt like it gets another touchdown. I can't go into overtime again. Like the game is getting too stressful. And the atmosphere at NRG was so thick, yelling, loud, high emotion sit down and we'll make a mistake, then we we'll get back up again, right? And so processing that is still able to be so damn accurate because I was losing my shit. I was uncomfortable. My hands were shaking and no one even knew I was there except my mom and dad, right? It's like, I mean, how do you do that, Greg? How do you settle yourself to settle the players when 28, 30 million people are watching? Like, Talk to me, bro. I need more you, of that understanding. You ready? You trust the process. You have trained yourself to believe that short memory is the of all gigantic superior athletes and people who are making a killing, people who are running great businesses. You can't get 
preoccupied with what happened in the last series. It's over. Let it go. It's hard to let go of yesterday's baggage. So you know it's hard to let go of baggage that's 30 seconds ago. <laughs> but you tra you've trained to let go of successes. You've trained to let go of failure and move on to the next step and wait patiently for the opportunity to get back in the game. That's Tom Brady's son. That's 28 to three, sitting over on the sideline with a, a towel over your head, just saying, I'm going to get back in the game. I'm going to be focused and disciplined. That's all you can teach. And if a 19, 20, 20 year old can be, begin to buy into it at this age, in this stage, his future is pretty bright. Talk to me about Blake Quorum now for a second, because I want to get to the pressure and the mental preparedness or the mental state of mind, because there was two plays I want to highlight. One was the Alabama game, the overtime game, um, when Blake actually, the game was tied. We go right into into regulation, go straight into overtime. Michigan has the ball first. Yes. And we have to score. And he makes it clear that you can't stop me. What is that mental game? Like, because that won the game. And I thought it was so perfect that he literally came back and said, we have unfinished business and that we gave him the ball and we put it in his hands. I thought it was poetic, personally. Uh, look, uh, Blake, Blake was so confident about this year. He was confident about that. See, what people don't understand is the fourth quarter is the game, especially at this level, when you are evenly matched. It's an even match. You saw it in all the all four you know, with all four teams. They were they were they were equal. And I'm telling anybody that will listen, when you're thinking about Michigan football. Think about the fourth quarter and go back and look over the whole season. Go back and look at last season. Fourth quarter. It's not just the defense is always going to come through. The defense is going to come through because our linemen, offensive and defensive linemen, are stronger and have more endurance than yours. Mm -hmm. There's only one way to cheat in sports that's not cheating, to be in better mm -hmm. shape than a guy across from. The gal, the gal on it don't matter if we're talking about women, when we're talking about men's sports. If you are in better shape than your opponent, they may be better than you athletically, but they can't yeah. outlast you. In that fourth quarter, brother, you're gonna find out who in shape and who's not in shape. And our people believe that in the fourth quarter, you your tongue gonna be hanging out and we're gonna be rolling. I feel like Blake has mentally prepared for that moment, like his whole life up to this point of giving him the football and in overtime against Bama to win the game, because I think that just takes a mental fortitude. And again, what we were talking about earlier about loving the pressure. Ooh, I mean, he, had, he expected to score. We expected him to score. The lineman insisted that he could score. You understand? Mm -hmm. It was not just Blake. It was that whole crew that's saying, hey, we're about to get it done. And Blake is a finisher, baby. He's a finisher. He's going to finish. It, everyone could start, but how will you finish? And he was – oh, look at you excited. Okay. I, I, can't you even, I, can't, I can't even hold it, Greg, because that goes back to your family analogy. That goes back to we're looking for family, not stars, because everything you just said. I love that line where you said, the offensive lineman insisted that you score. And so for a lineman to insist that you score, that means a lineman needs to do their job to insist that he scores. The coaches and staff on the sideline expected him to get that touchdown. So you guys created plays and moments in order to run up the right play to insist, to expect that he wins. And then he expects that of himself that he's going to win. That goes to that, that freshman class changing the culture. Uh, that goes to the meetings you had with them freshman year. Uh, and that goes to the recruit that you guys built in to create that family. Because when you're family, you want your brother and sister to win. 
It's like you can talk all the stuff you want inside the house to each other, but when we go outside of our house so we present to the world, we are one unit, right? And you are going to win. One mind. That was it. <laughs> you understand? One mind, one dream, one team. <laughs> I'm stuck, bro. Bro, that line about, right there when you said think about, but think about, and, think and, about and, how good. Think about how good, I don't care what you think about Jim Harbaugh. I'm talking about a performer. I'm talking about how good is this guy who could be suspended for six games and the team already know what to do. The team was prepared. See, I don't believe in luck. The only luck I believe in is if opportunity knocks and you're prepared. If opportunity knocks and you ain't prepared, was that unlucky? No, you wasn't prepared. <laughs> but I'm glad you mentioned Jim Harbaugh. What was that mental? I mean, talk about a, a mental roller coaster for him. Suspend, you know, uh, off the, the sidelines for the first three games of the season, off the sidelines for the last three games of the season. Like this mental dance, because to use a family analogy, if you, if you want to think about the head of household, right? Like, the head of household needs to be the strong one, right? Can't show like any weakness because it makes the children afraid. Like if we see daddy afraid, then how am I supposed to feel, right? And so I'm just wondering, like, what was his mental fortitude like throughout this year? I mean, talk about trials and tribulations. Oh, and talk about frustration. Talk about somebody pushing your buttons. Talking about haters uniting against you. Well, the funniest thing in the world, and uh, I shared with uh, Harbaugh that I was going to be talking about him in the next few months. Mm -hmm. and, and I asked him to read me of the, the, one of the greatest speeches I, I ever saw. Him. And he talked to, to the team one, one time about you can either be bitter or you can be better. And he gave this whole whole piece where he described individuals. He called them out of, of, of the meeting. He called a, a, a player and said, so-and-so went through this and this and this and was disappointed in that and didn't start for three years. And he could have been bitter or he could have been better. And he chose to be better. And because of that, we are looking at victory after victory after victory. He talked about that, man. I was like overwhelmed. He gave concrete examples of individuals in the room who could have been better, but chose to be better. So, I mean, I mean, this is, this sticks with me, right? And then he's going through this roller coaster. And, bruh, he was pretty perturbed. And then I saw him shift. I'm telling you the truth that I saw. I ain't telling you what somebody told me. I saw him shift and he began to mirror his own speech. He could have been bitter or he could get better. And he's continued to improve and his coaching staff responded. I mean, can you, why, why would, look, Ms. Coach Moore is not the type of person who's going to get on TV and act out. He was so emotionally overwhelmed. He was so proud of his coach and his team and his staff. He was so fascinated that the coach trusted him, trusted him with his career, with his life, with his team, that he was in, he was emotional and never saw it. He never saw it coming. That's not his personality or style. Bruh, Jim Harbaugh created a culture where if he in the game or ain't in the game, they know what to do mm. and how to do it and why they should do it and who they doing it for. <laughs> That's the mark of a great leader. The Bruh. mark of a great leader is that I don't have to be heavy handed and micromanaging you in order to know what you need to be doing because I've coached you or I've led you along the way so I can step out. And you can still know exactly what to do. He surrendered his ego and stopped being preoccupied with how he felt and how it was affecting him and did everything he could to prepare everyone around him to do what they do best. And that's be the best. 
Better Not Bitter. Ooh. Jerome, right? Better Not Bitter. That says mm-hmm. a lot about, like, that's, but that's the definition of, like, the Michigan way and the culture, right? Like, we talk about the Michigan difference. Like, that's that Michigan difference. Harbaugh being a Michigan man. Like, that is, like, the Michigan difference. Again, I know you're a Michigan junkie. I know that Michigan is is in my blood. And I'm not mad at anybody that doesn't like Michigan because they lose to Michigan. But that's a whole different issue. <laughs> but I'm, on a serious note, I really don't uh, think that you have to love Michigan to understand peak performance. Yes. What we saw was peak performance. What we saw was the mental game taken to the next level. And it started at the top. It started at the top with the, the, the athletic director believing without question or pause that he had the right guy. And he turned and he turned him, he turned him into a guy that had stuff to prove. And he proved it. And then it kept going and got better and better and better. So you know, Talk about that mental example. order to the. It's an example for any corporation, any institution, any family, anyone that's trying to do something special. Get get out of your head, Michigan. Me, I don't like Michigan. I don't care if you like Michigan. You better study what we did, because <laughs> it's the truth. I'm glad you brought Ward Manual, audience. I'm going to land the plane on Sharon uh, Sharon Moore here, but I'm glad you brought up Ward Manual because. I think what he did underestimated because there was so much social pressure for him to fire Harbaugh um, when we weren't winning, not during our winning season. Um, there was contract. I don't, don't want to get into details, but there was this contract negotiations and conversations. Should it get renewed? Should it not get renewed? And I think there's something to be said about an athletic director or audience, a board of directors to say, no, we have confidence still in our CEO that this is the one to lead this company into record profits. We see this shift. We see what is possible. We see the changes. We have to allow this CEO time to work the system in order for us to get to brand capacity and market capacity and market cap, just as Ward Emanuel had that belief in system and Jim Harbaugh to be the one to lead it. I think having putting that unequivocal trust gives Harbaugh the confidence knowing I could maybe take some risk. I could be a little more adventurous here. I know that this institutional corporation, the team that has my back unequivocally. I think there's a power in that and the security. Yeah. It's called empowerment. That's what it is. And people use that word loosely, but again, Ward Manuel empowered Harbaugh. Harbaugh Mm -hmm. empowered his coach, his assistant, Man, the, his assistant coaches are ugh, the the best thing that's gonna happen to us is that we're gonna lose them. That means that they are so good. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody in their right mind is gonna be trying to poach and, and come get them. And if you yeah. are a great company, you're gonna lose some of your stars. And and if you're winning, hey, peace be with you. Because but that's the that's the legacy. The coaching tree is about to expand. Because yep. I'm telling you that uh, he prepared, I mean, think about how good they are, man. Mentor. Mentor steps in for, what was it, Mac, Donald Mac? I forgot to do his name, but yeah. Um, right. All I yeah, know yeah. is is my, my the, when we lost our defensive coordinator and he went back to the, to the Ravens, I was heartbroken. I was mm-hmm. so impressed with him. And then Mentor shows up. And, and if you look at Mentor, he, you're talking about, how is he coaching Giants? Yeah. <laughs> Mentor's <laughs> mind. His yeah. mind is the mind of a Giant. He's a Titan. He's, a, he's, he's, he's an unbelievably gifted, talented, and seasoned veteran and, and can teach, can teach. Coaching is teaching and managing people. And this guy is one, I've never seen anyone, uh, I I haven't seen too many people with these skill sets and coaches including these people into his program. Mike Hart. Mike. Yes. And uh, the running backs made it crystal clear 
that we were going to win that game. You understand? So the list of characters that are assistant coaches is insane. The brilliance, though, of Coach Harbaugh, knowing not only recruits to go after, but personnel and coaches to go after, and then to coach up the coaches enough to where he trusts them unequivocally to be great at their position and the coordinating position to do. I think that's just a great testament of a great leader, knowing how to pick the right people on your team to create the winning team. And as you said earlier, to let go of ego. It seems like Coach Harbaugh throughout these last few years has to let go of his ego. Um, and I'm not saying he had one before or not, but I'm just saying you have to let the ego go. Ego is not a bad great. word. I know in pop culture, ego is this bad word. You have to manage the ego. The ego must be your ally and not your enemy. And his ego is his ally. And so he I knows know when to, uh, the great leaders know how to follow. That's the mm -hmm. hardest thing to teach. Coaching coaches is an oxymoron. Is <laughs> Yeah. Is one of the most difficult things in the world. Coaching smart people, teaching smart people. It's Harvard Business Review, circa 2008, has an article yeah. talking about how hard it is to teach smart people. So coaching coaches is not as easy as people think. It's not. <laughs> or oh, it's as as rap, think. <laughs> I could talk to you for five hours, but as we wrap, I think the moment where I, I the, for me, the shift, there was many shifts, right? I guess it's hard to, to pick the shift. But I think there was something about that moment when the team lands, Harbaugh lands in Happy Valley, and then it decided that he's not going to be allowed to coach, to be on the sidelines. How does the team come together um, in order uh, to put up a winning victory against Penn State that next day? If you have Sharon Moore at the lead. If you have a championship culture. It galvanizes the troops. You're going to attack our lead dog? And you, and you think it's going to affect us? All it did was make us more... Com all the, it's the worst thing they could have done. We might not have had the season if they hadn't kept messing with Harbaugh. I'm serious. Think about this. If Harbaugh and the haters hadn't been united, we might not have been this good. But our team and our assistant coaches were motivated and inspired by the adversity. Instead of being crippled by it, it strengthened the team. The team. The team. The team. G Harden, I love you, man. I could talk to you all day. I got to end it at some point. I mean, you got to come back for the next season to unpack the anatomy of a championship when we bring the trophy home again <laughs> uh, next year. Uh, I, I just think that you are gifted uh, at what you do. Um, the way you think about mental preparedness, you put it in a framework that I just haven't seen it done before. Uh, and I just thank you for being making it digestible, thinking for making it relatable, um, thank you for helping all of the other greats that we've enjoyed watching throughout the years, but thank you for helping people like myself and others. Uh, thank you for writing this book, uh, Stay Sane in an Insane World, to help others unlock everything that you're just talking about right now uh, for peak performance. Um, and thank you for teaching me to enjoy the pressure. Um, it's a muscle I'm still working on and to accept myself for who I am um, and to forget about the mistakes I made 30 seconds ago um but i just thank you for everything man i love you um thank you for the brotherhood and thank you for being the most incredible human being in my life and so and to getting this team to become helping be a part of this team uh, to help raise that trophy for us to be national champions man. you're too kind and too generous i appreciate you and thank you so much love you man go blue baby go blue <laughs>